Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Speed Art Museum on such a beautiful day. Um, and you also get a view of what will become Speed Outdoors. Um, this is from the landscape architect's drawings here. So we have that to look forward to uh, opening in 2025. Uh, before we begin today, I'd ask that everyone please uh, turn off their phones. And I'm Scott Urbis. I'm curator of decorative arts and design here at the Speed. And again, my, my pleasure to welcome you today um, to what is the 10th iteration of the Adele and Leonard Light series, Art Design and Innovation. Um, this was a series that was endowed in 2014 by Leonard and Adele's children, Jenna, Jonathan, and Peter. And in addition to this lecture series, uh, Jenna, Jonathan, and Peter have also further established an endowed Adele and Leonard Light Glass Art Award. This will be a biennial acquisition that will kick off next year, focused on emerging and mid-career artists. And I'm so grateful to the Light family for making that possible too, to sustain Adele and Leonard Light's support for artists, and also to continue to add to the Light collection here at the Speed, which you'll see in our atrium and also on the second floor of this building as well. So I can't think of a better way to celebrate both the 10th anniversary of this series and the upcoming Art Award than to welcome Susie Silbert today. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout her independent and museum-based curatorial practice, Susie has very dramatically expanded the ways in which museums, collectors, and the public engage with artists and respond to artists who work with glass as their medium. For example, her curatorial leadership at the Corning Museum of Glass led to landmark exhibitions like New Glass Now, and also to a wider range of artists receiving Corning's very prestigious Rakow Commission. So we're lucky to have Susie here today. I'm really jealous of her lecture title and wish I would have thought of something like that too. But please, welcome Susie. Thank you guys, thank you so much for being here and thank you Scott for that uh, really lovely welcome and thank you to the whole, the whole team at the Speed Museum um, for bringing me in. It's been so seamless, it's lovely, it's lovely to be treated so nicely and to the Light family who, um, who I, got to, I got to meet last night and um, I tell you, I still have, I still have like a tingly feeling um, from, from learning more about uh, about the family and learning more about the collection and the kind of visionary leadership of the um, earlier generation and then today. So I um, so even before I give you this talk, I'm so grateful uh, for this moment to be here and hopefully. I'll do okay during the talk, and you'll be grateful too. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, a couple of things, a couple of things. One, I get very excited about things, and I have a tendency to talk quickly. So I need right now a commitment from y'all that you will let me know if I'm talking too quickly. I have a little symbol for this. You can go like this. <laughs> And that will be hilarious for me and for everybody. So please don't be shy. Just do that. Um, and uh, and what else? I'm gonna I'm gonna go through here, and I'm gonna try and do my very best job. But you know, maybe it's maybe I missed things, or maybe you come up with some great questions during it. So just keep them in mind, and we'll answer them at the end. One more thing before we start. The other thing that makes me so just deeply thrilled to be here in Louisville is that I used to live in Western North Carolina and I'm from Chicago. So I used to make the drive between the two of them with some frequency and I used to stop in Louisville and Louisville has always been kind of a magical place in my heart uh, for that reason. I just really love it. So um, thank you again for bring, being here. All right. Reflect, refract, encounter, smash glassy ways to see and know. And this image here, which is of a Spencer Finch piece, same artist who has uh, that light work out in the atrium, is clickbait, you guys. I'm not actually planning to talk about it in the talk, but the picture is so good that I wanted to use it so you'd all come. 
It's true. I'm, I'm being, I'm, I'm honest uh, here. Oh, listen, I told my husband I'd record this, so I'm just going to turn that on. Um, but I do have some extra images about this at the end of my talk. And so if we have time and you're not tired of hearing about me, we can do that too. All right, so, so you don't feel like you're tricked completely by my use of uh, the Spencer Finch piece. But almost everything I'm going to show you today is actually commission-based. Um, and in a way, it's really about the power, including this piece. It's about the power of commissions and the way that commissions can really push forward a material and push forward a way of thinking. And so um, it is really special, again, for me to be here uh, with this light glass award that's upcoming. Um, all right, reflect. Uh, are there any physicists in the house? No. Good. Good. <sighs> I live in, no, I love physicists, but, you know, I made these graphics myself, and huh, I live in Corning, New York, where there are a lot of physicists, and it always makes me a little shy. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about an artist named Anjali Srinivasan, whose work, um, work is in mirrored glass, but more than just mirrored glass and showing us images of ourself, gives us an opportunity to think in new ways, to reflect on what it is to be a person and what it is to be from a place. Um, and so this image, which I am sure is hard to tell what, what it is, comes, comes from comes from this piece, which even now is hard to tell what it is, so let me tell you. It is a six foot tall by four foot wide breathing, and you'll see that in a little bit, piece of, piece of glass, not one piece. It's made of a bunch of blown, mirrored glass blown and then mirrored. How does she mirror it? She takes, um, she takes a mirrorizing solution. It's pretty cool. She makes these big bubbles, really thin. She puts this mirrorizing solution and she rolls it all around, pours it out, then puts silicone in, uh, rolls that all around, and then smashes these pieces on the floor, which is incredible. Glass is precious until it isn't, until it is again. And then she puts it together in these uh, textiles. And the front of this is, a, is like a textile of glass. And how she does it is, is, un, is kind of unbelievable. But um, what it does, because it has this, because it's all made from blown glass, each one of those shards is a convex mirror. And when you stand in front of it, like this person on the left, you almost disappear. You can't see yourself. You become a little speck, just a speck. Uh, your, your image is totally gone. And when you stand still, it's like you don't exist. But when you move, and I'll show you this in a little bit, when you move, every reflection, that little speck of dust moves, and especially if you're with somebody else, so that every small, tiny movement can make the whole world a different a different place. Now that's a cool thing, and it would be really cool, I guess, I suppose, if Anjali just came up with that itself, and maybe I told you the story, and maybe that's enough. But what's uh, particularly great, oh, here she is, here she is, <laughs> Anjali herself, is that it comes from not just Anjali, but it comes from her deep research into, into place and into where she's from. So Anjali is Indian. She lives in Massachusetts now, and she teaches at uh, Mass Art although she's back in India for a year and a half on sabbatical, lucky her. And when she was growing up in India, she was really interested in, actually, she wanted to be a pilot. She wanted to be a pilot. And her dad is an admiral in the Navy, and she grew up all over India. And um, she, she really wasn't that structured. Her grandmother raised her uh, a whole bunch, and she was always playing with, playing with materials really in it. And her grandmother's dying wish was that her parents let her be an artist. And eventually, she came to that too. And she went to school um, to study accessories design, which is sort of, in India, a kind of cross between what we would think of as maybe accessories design, jewelry, and those kinds of things, but also industrial design. And she really, she, she had an assignment to go work in Ferozabad, which is, um, which is a place where there's a lot of glass working. Remember Pier 1? Uh, all of the glass in Pier 1, pretty much, from Ferozabad. And she went there and she saw the glass craftsmen working and she was like, this is incredible. I want to learn how to um, make glass myself. But in India, there wasn't an opportunity for her to do that. And so she was thinking, where can I go? Where can I go to learn about glass? And she was like, well, I've heard of a glass artist before. I've heard of 
cocktail Chihuly. She wrote to him. She wrote to him as like an 18-year-old, 20-year-old, I don't know. She wrote to him and she said, hey, Dale, <laughs> I'm interested in studying glass. Uh, where can I go to do that? And guess what? He wrote her back. And he told her that she could go, she told her a couple of places, and she ended up going to the Alfred um, School of, uh, Alfred School University uh, has a big, long title of its glass and ceramics program, but it's just actually down the road from where I live in Corning. And she went there, and she studied, and after she was there, she worked at the Med, and she did a bunch of different kinds of things. And then in 2004, 2005, she moved back to India, and she had this cool job working for the Indian government, surveying glass craft all throughout um, the little villages. And there, each village has a, like a particular craft that they do. And there's all sorts of glass ones, making glass bangles, or making the little mirrors that go on clothes, or making sequins. And they just do that. But they hadn't really been, like, nobody was tracking that kind of craft knowledge until she did that. So she did that for the Indian government. And while she was traveling, she remembered these incredible, um, mirror palaces from her youth in places like this, the Agra Fort in Uttar Pradesh. And these mirror palaces, which were built, there you go, here's a picture of the Shish Mahal, or mirror palace, in the Agra Fort, um, commissioned between 1631 and 1640, are these incredible places that are covered everywhere in mirrored glass, convex mirrored glass, just like the piece that I showed you at the beginning. And they were these unbelievable spaces, kind of a more public area of the um, giant fort complex. And when you walked in, it would do exactly what I told you her piece would do, that you, you know, would go in and you almost disappear if you stand still. But if you move, you know, your movement is amplified. And Anjali remembered going to these places as a child with her parents as they moved through India. And she was thinking to herself as she was surveying Glasscraft, she thought, oh, I should learn about the craftsmen that take care of these places. And she searched and searched and searched for them. And then, and she couldn't find them. And then she met a, another researcher, comes from a textile background, and um, he was the grandson, he was an erstwhile prince of, uh, of a part of India, and his great-grandfather had actually commissioned one of these shish mahal, these mirror palaces, and he told her, you know, you can look and look and look, but you're never going to find the craftsman. He said, actually, it wasn't just like one group of craftsmen. It was actually three groups of nomadic craftsmen that were responsible for making and maintaining these spaces. They would, one group would make the glass. Another would bring it across from Ferozabad over to Uttar Pradesh, where, where forts like this are, are made, and other places, Rajasthan, and mirror it. And another group would install it. And they... They maintain these spaces for generations. This is what the tribes would do. But in 2001, there was a major earthquake. And that earthquake completely disrupted this entire craft knowledge and way, and way of being. And all of those tribes stopped doing those things that they did traditionally. They became assimilated into the rest of society. They became rickshaw drivers, or maybe they sold cucumbers on the side of the road. And now these unbelievable spaces, these spaces that had so much meaning for Anjali, and Anjali believes for other people, that had this message about what it is to be a person, that if we stand still, if we are alone, we are small, we can't make an impact. But if we move, even a small movement, if we do that together, we can influence everything around us. And and she was so sad that now these places you used to be able to go into, now they're walled off. You can't even go. Your eyes can't even touch them, as she says. Here's an image of what it's like at night, you know, with a candle. Lights it all up like the stars above. So she began a practice where she was trying to recreate this idea, to give people a sense of what these, uh, what these mirror palaces were like while she was doing her graduate studies at the Rhode Island School of Design. And one of the first pieces she made was this one with a milk carton where she has her, um, where she in, put this mirrored glass in a milk carton. She just did that you know, kind of on a whim. She was thinking that the shape of, of a milk jug is similar to the shape of the, um, what do we call these? Arches. Arches, thank you, everybody. I appreciate the participation. Uh, arches in, in, these, um, in these forts. Another thing I didn't say, 
but might be interesting to a few of you, is that uh, these, these forts were built by the Mughals. The Mughals were Islamic. They came from Iran. This idea of the mirror palaces comes from Iran. And there are other artists that use this kind of uh, technique, like most notably Monir Farman Farmayan, who is Persian and comes from a modernist tradition. And her work in this mirror is totally different. But Anjali, um, working, in, working in India, and she installed this, and she realized, oh, it not only has the same kind of shape as the arch, but when you touch it, because it's in a mirror jug, it moves, it breathes. And that reminded her of the way that these buildings are like living creatures, that the thing that's missing is the hand of the craftsman, that the world around us, the built world, is all built by people, by human touch, and these buildings in particular. But with the craftsman gone, all of that was leaving. So she started a body of work that was trying to connect people with the idea of of mirror and breath. And this is an early piece that she did that has uh, electronics on the inside. And when you touched it, you completed the circuit and the piece breathed back at you. <laughs> Very unnerving. <laughs> but exactly you know, what she was uh, going for. And then she did a series of other pieces that's trying to bring this uh, relationship between the, the Shish Mahal, the mirror palace, and the, and the person together. So you see this glass glove greeting. She made this silicone hand, you know, glove uh, with mirror, and she would shake people's hands. And as she did, the glass would degrade. It would come off, you know, that, that the interaction that we weather, uh, glass weathers and we weather. And she made this dress, this dress where where her body took on the curves of the Shish Mahal, these mirror palaces with their arches. And she would walk through, uh, walk through town and um, see the way that people's, you know, it changed everyone's orientation <laughs> to, to the world. Actually, she said she, she didn't, she was very surprised to realize that as she walked, people would really just touch her, you know, <laughs> in ways that she didn't expect uh, because it was so unusual. Okay. So when, uh, when, let's stay here, when I, um, when I was at Corning, every year we would do a rake out commission, a, a commission with an, an artist, and I would come up with um, a list of artists that I would think, and I would bring that to the team internally, and, um, and I, uh, we would, you know, choose somebody. And I was thinking, uh, when, I when I would talk to artists that I was thinking about working with, you know, I'd get in touch with them and I'd say, well, what would you make? you know, what would you make? If you could just make something, if you had $25,000, what would you make? And Anjali told me that she had always dreamed um, of making a giant one of these pieces that took all of the learning of the last images I showed you and made a wall that could breathe. And I said, well, let's figure that out, you know? Let's see if we can do that. She'd never done it before. And um, whew, guess when this commission happened, you guys? Guess. Yes. Mm. We formally commissioned her in January of 2020. Oh, God. And she runs this glass program at MassArt. So, of course, COVID happened and she wasn't sure if she was going to have access to glass. She's trying to make the most ambitious piece of her life. Um, she's trying to learn how to teach people to blow glass online, which you know some in the audience can understand, right? This is a challenging time. Not to mention the fact that this piece involves all sorts of mechanics and needs all these different networks of people, digital folks and all sorts of people, and they all you know moved, scattered to the four winds. So. <sighs> Needless to say, this piece took a lot longer than an average rake out commission, which we'd be working on for a year, maybe two. This one took three years and only just debuted um, last uh, November. But it was worth the wait um, because here you can see it being installed. It's pretty cool. It's big and it's magical. It's so magical that while we were installing it, usually, you know, the Corning Museum of Glass like basically never closes. It, it's open seven days a week and there's no time for the installers to work when we aren't open to the public. So I like to think, you know, we do a lot of glass blowing demonstrations for the public, but we also do art handling and, and other things, right? 
usually people see that we're installing and they're, you know, a little shy to come over. This piece is so alluring that they were just like right up there. Um, even before we figured out if the, if the like added uh, the breathing works. And so here is what this piece looks like, just looks like when you're standing there and somebody walks by. It's magical. It's deeply, deeply magical. It's magical to look at a piece, look at a mirror. You can tell that it's a mirror, you know? But you can't really see your reflection, and then you see, you see that you're making this big impact. And, and maybe you can tell, and maybe here you can tell, well, oh, yes, this one, bonus. Behind this piece, Anjali felt so bad that it took her so long to make this work, which wasn't her fault. It was really global supply chains. Like everything, every headline from the pandemic, like that big ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, that, like every single thing, like it was in this piece. So she didn't need to feel bad, but she did. So she spent months, months burning this incredible pattern, which is based on the original arch in the Agra Fort, which you can see on the right into the back of this piece that literally no one will see except for the art handlers and the registrars and the conservators. And that's totally in line with what her work is about, right? Her work is about the unseen people, the people that you don't even think about that maintain every single space, this space, and make it possible for us all to sit here. Like, I, you know, the bathrooms in this museum are so clean, you know? <laughs> Like, that is what this is about. That's what that attention is about. Um, and the, the folks that, you know, make, make it so easy for me to roll in and just, like, plug in, my, plug in my laptop and do my thing. Okay, so here you can see a little bit of what the breath is like. You can't see it yet. You have to really watch. Now you might be able to see. It's subtle. It's really subtle. When you stand in front of this piece, if you're me and kind of self-involved, and you stand in front of the piece, it can be hard to see the breathing. It has a motion detector that notices when you're there, and it starts subtly breathing. But I am a magpie, you guys. And when I stand in front of this piece, I see me, 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 me. <laughs> Except for that I've had to train myself. But for those of us that are like more yogis, you know, like my husband, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> um, uh, you can notice the breath. And when you stand to the side, you can notice the breath. This piece subtly breathes to you, and it breathes to you with the pattern of the arch in the Agra Fort. What do I mean by that? I mean that inside, behind this, uh, this silicone skin, is a metal structure that is exactly the architecture of that arch that was in the slide before that would have been great if I'd pointed out to you. And then it has uh, mechanics that, that breathe. And it breathes with these impact cracks. Um, yeah, in the piece. And there's so many things that you can think about with that. Like there's the things about the history of India, the way that the Mughals coming in um, broke up what was then Hindustan, the way that the British came and British colonialism uh, ended the Mughal Empire. You can think about the, the um, you can really think about that earthquake that changed the trajectory of these pieces, the, the mirror palaces, all the way. But you can also think about what we've all been through over the last three years and the impact of COVID and what happened to us uh, all during that time. Um, so I think it's a pretty incredible thing. When we were working in January of 2020 to identify what this piece would be, Originally, Anjali had thought, you know, maybe it should have a touch component. And of course, can't have that in the museum. It would have been destroyed immediately. But then all of a sudden, it was COVID, and we really couldn't have a touch component. But then over the course of that three years, this piece took on so much more meaning. Because here it is, a flat glass screen, essentially that we were all looking into in countless Zooms or FaceTimes or trying to connect, you know, calling our loved ones that were far away that we couldn't see. And we were hoping, hoping beyond hope that we might make a connection, that through this screen, this impersonal screen, we might reach out and maybe that screen, the people that were watching it could feel like there was a breath on another side. And so, 
Um, so, sorry, you know what, I didn't put my presenter, I didn't put my presenter thing on, so I have to remember where we're at in the slides, you guys. I shouldn't tell you that, but that's what's going on. Um, <laughs> and so, this reflect uh, gives us another way, I think, to see ourselves and see our place in the world and a reminder of a reminder to act, a reminder to move, a reminder to reach out and be with other folks. Okay. Reflect. And now for something different. A uh, rake out commission that I had running almost sim well, simultaneously with the one that I just showed you is with an incredible artist named Leo Tukoski. This piece called The 36th Chamber, there's so much going on in this work. And uh, the Rake Out Commissions, I mean, I've been in glass for a long time, and so I've known most of the artists that I worked with for a long time, but this one is a little bit more personal for me than many of the others, because I've known Leo for, for a very long time, and actually the very first artwork that I ever bought for myself was a piece by Leo. I bought it in 2006 for $600, which was three months rent. I had no business buying it. But the power of the work, um, the power of the work spoke to me. And Leo is a kind of artist that, you know, if you know, you know, but now people know. Uh, they didn't know for a long time. Here's a little bit of a close up. Um, Leo is, uh, one of the things that makes Leo so amazing in what his practice is, is that forever, really for more than 20 years, he has been making the hot shop a place of hip hop activity. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that hip hop, and uh, especially the conscious hip hop that he is inspired by, is composed of it composed of four parts. So we have the MCs, um, that's the people rapping. Uh, you can see some of his influences here, Wu-Tang and Eric B and Rakim and Erica Badu and KRS-One. And there's break dancing, um, which is about moving the body in, in different ways. And there's uh, graffiti, which you can see a little bit in wild style. And, uh, oh, and DJing, of course, uh, which is making the beats. Each one of those things, each one of those aspects of hip hop are a way to control the body, uh, to control the body in very specific ways. And so is glass blowing, and so is glass blowing within Leo's practice. I mean, each one of these things, each element of hip hop in so many ways is about controlling the breath. And they're also expansive practices that bring together references from all over the world into new forms that take history and remix it and give it to us in another way and make, make things relevant in a new way, which is exactly what Leo does. Actually, it's exactly what Leo does in a way that I hope to convey to you, um, but that was so, uh, when I really understood what he was doing, this is an artist I've known for almost 20 years, but only in the process of doing studio visits with him did I really understand what he was up to in the blown work. And understanding that made me lose sleep for multiple days. Because, because what he does, he is literally, he is literally one of the very best craftsmen I have been privileged to work with in recent days. And he, years, and he is doing things that are so next level that us mere mortals almost couldn't understand. And I lost sleep, and actually, I'm still like, I'm shy about it, that I feel like it is my job, let's see if I can convince you, it is my job to try to show you why what he's doing is so wild. Because I thought, man, I've been in glass for a long time, and it took me a little while to understand this, and I can't believe you're doing that. But let me back up. Leo lives in Brooklyn, but he's from Miami originally. He was born in New Mexico. He, he's lived in all sorts of different places. He also went to Alfred in upstate New York, not far from me. And he had formative times in Vermont, but he would never tell you that. Um, <laughs> and he is drawn to places and to techniques and to, um, and to practices that bring together lots of different references because he, he, does, he brings those things together in himself. And um, he, he started out in graffiti, and he went into glass. He wasn't even going to go to college. He wasn't going to go to college. He thought he was going to do a different thing. He started working in metal. 
And he was working in he was working in Vermont with his at his uncle's bakery. This is like deep cuts on Leo working at his uncle's bakery in Vermont. And his cousin was doing metalsmithing, and he went over uh, iron working, ornamental iron. And he learned like that guy went to Alfred, and he was like, "Oh, you can do this in college, cool." And he showed up at Alfred, and he couldn't get into glass class. He was doing metal, but he learned about neon, and he realized that he could use neon to take his tag, his uh, the graffiti, which is about amplifying your voice marking your space, letting people know that you're there. And he could make it in, in neon letters, which have the same effect of graffiti, that, but in a different way, where you can look at this and then close your eyes, and then it's still there, you know, still there. Answer, 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 which is what the piece on the left says, um, which is his handle. Uh, and later, after college, he actually uh, started to work in glass. And um, it was in 2005 that he, which is right around the time when I bought my piece, that he started working with this uh, Graal technique. So on the right, you can see this historical, historical Graal, Swedish Graal. And on the left, you can see his piece. What's happening there? What's happening there is that, um, it is, is in a glassy way, he is blowing a small bubble. He's covering it in color, in blue and then in that kind of peach, and then cooling it down and sandblasting in his tag. And then he's heating it back up again and inflating it. And so you have this crisp graffiti. He's found a way. You know, that whole way he's struggling to think about how can I put that graffiti mark into the blown glass? And then he figured it out using this historical referent, which is exactly like it's exactly like a DJ taking samples from different music, uh, different cuts from all over the place and putting them together in a track. It is a way of accessing history, of paying homage to history, but your history doesn't have to look like what comes out. It can be a different thing. And uh, graffiti, graffiti, which is uh, totally identified with hip hop, but actually has a different history. It comes out of a slightly different tradition and an incredibly multicultural tradition. Um, uh, is um, a, a big reference point to him. And graffiti, phase two is one of the first and er earliest uh, graffiti artists and really well known in, in uh, graffiti history for his contributions, which are many, but they include things like making the bubble letters and he's the guy that brought the arrow into graffiti. And the arrow becomes a, a super important thing, not just in graffiti, but in, um, but in Leo's work. And in 2016, he had this uh, he had this incredible breakthrough. So, and the breakthrough is that instead of just putting his tag on the surface of the glass or into the glass using the Graal technique, he could actually make the glass bubble into into the graffiti elements, and he could start making these arrows. This was his first experiment into it, and it's called So Many Styles, because what he's done is he's taken all these arrows and made all these different graffiti artists uh, arrows, you know, their particular way. It's like, it's like citing your references as a way to do it. But what makes it crazy, what makes it crazy is how many of you guys have seen glass blowing happen? Many of you. Oh, this makes me so happy. And if you haven't, um, we've got some folks over here that can show you some good glass blowing in Louisville. Um, you should go and make sure you check out Flame Run and see what's uh, happening at the university. Um, so if you've seen glass blowing, you know that glass blowing wants to be a bubble. It wants to be a bubble, it wants to be round. What he is doing is sculpting it flat and sharp points, and he is doing that without the use of molds. Without the use of molds. He's doing it by sculpting it hot in the hot shop. How do you even do that? That's incredible. You know what that's like? That is like, that is like, you know, glass blowing is like a pirouette in ballet, you know? A nice spin. What he's doing is like a pop and lock. In, in hip hop dance. It is controlled, it is angular, but it is, it, it is absolute technique. You can't do that without really knowing. And here he is uh, working, working, on, uh, working on a piece. After he took that space, that, that piece wasn't just notable because it was because it was arrows. It's notable because it was hanging in space. It allowed his work to occupy, graffiti to occupy, not just the walls, not be on the periphery, but literally be in the center. And this piece, which he did in uh, Sweden, he has a very close collaborator in Sweden, and he does a lot of his work there. 
is another way where he could have the arrows hanging in the center, but then the light could project and he could occupy both the center and the periphery, uh, which I think is a is powerful, is powerful for especially the, the message of hip hop and the message of hip hop within, within glass. Okay, also, while he was in Sweden, he started cutting the surface of the work, like you can see in this piece at the Berry Museum. And he learned that in Sweden, these deep cuts in the glass, and learned it from traditional Swedish glass, but that wasn't actually what he was thinking about. What he's thinking about in there is actually his grandmother's depression glass collection, which he, he, the colors of depression glass, the light pinks, the light greens, the smoky, the smoky colors, that is actually his earliest glass reference, remembering his grandma's collection of glass in Philadelphia and thinking about the way that that glass is accessible to so many people. And it's still inexpensive. I think this piece was on eBay for $13. It too could be yours. Um, <laughs> uh, and he takes those cuts. Here in this piece, the, the cuts look more traditional, but what he what he's done with it and what he did in his uh, Reikau commission, the 36th chamber, is he takes them and he uses them expressively, expressively to make more hip hop marks. And he is taking, so this is what you do, right? This is what he's done. He's blown that glass. He's blown that glass with so much precision, taking the round sphere and making it into angles. Uh, and then he cuts the surface and then he heats that thing back up again, which means that it could break at any time. It is so much workmanship of risk, and it's incredible how he does it. But those aren't the only, uh, the only references that he brings into his work. Perhaps this is a, a good time to tell you things that Leo doesn't really, this is not how he self-defines all the time. But Leo is uh, black and, and Ashkenazi Jewish, white Ashkenazi Jewish. And he brings together those different things. Being in between and being like at a places of nexus is, a, is important to him and to his practice. And so places like Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock and Turkey, Istanbul, which you see on the top right, are, in, are important places to him. And the way that Islamic architecture has used the word, that the word, uh, the word is, is the thing in Islam is an important thing to him. And he uses that in his work with another thing, uh, the supreme alphabet um, and the supreme understanding of the 5% nation, which, is, which comes from, it's a cultural social movement that comes from Harlem and is, um, is uh, der derived from Islam and its black American context and, in, and, and is really important to early hip hop. And in that, there is this idea of the supreme understanding, which involves the supreme mathematics and the supreme alphabet. And each letter in the alphabet has a different meaning, that it radiates out into the world. And using that as sort of a cipher, as a way to think about other things, he started to challenge himself to make letters in the, um, in the hot shop like this letter A, where you can see some of the, well, maybe you can see, oh, where are we? What happened? There we are. This letter A, uh, you can see um, in the top has an Islamic star. And it has also um, a really cool thing that he discovered, which is that you can take the um, same kind of markers that you use for tagging, uh, that maybe you've seen somebody write their name on a mailbox. I should say, Leo doesn't do any graffiti, illegal graffiti. I should make that very clear. Uh, it is just um, you know sketchbooks and on the glass. And you can fire it onto the surface of the glass, which he did with this letter A. And working. Uh, working on the Reika Commission, he was working on the letter B, which is breath and to be born. And he was working on this during the pandemic. And he was working on this uh, in the summer of 2020. And he was working on this after that. And he was working on it when his own daughter was still very young and thinking about who gets to breathe and what it means to be born and how we are all, uh, all, every moment, uh, being born and and living, and there's also well, there's deep cuts, but I'm not going to go into it. You can ask me about it later. Uh, in the title, which is the 36th chamber, which I hope any of you, maybe one of you, maybe two of you, know the Wu Tang album, and maybe none of you know the, the, the movie, the kung fu movie that that title is based on. But anyway, the, the cliff notes is that all of these things are about bringing knowledge to the people. Um, and that's what this work is about. 
Okay, are you still with me? Do you need to shake it out? I feel like I got a little long-winded and, you know, um, <laughs> and I'm nervous that you're not still with me. Are you with me? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys, what's cool about having a title like I have and structuring this is that you know exactly where we are in the talk, you know? We are halfway. And they're not all going to be as long, you know? They're going to be shorter from here on out. So you can do it. You can make it through. All right. Encounter. Just to review, we've had reflect. We've had Anjali's piece, which brings us to a different place ourselves, what our meaning is. We've had refract, which I didn't really close the loop on, but I will tell you what is interesting and the reason that Leo's work is refract is because it takes all the histories, it takes all of the things that make any single one of us up. It takes those things and it shifts them. You can take things and you can just keep it going. Or you can take things, you can remix them, and you can give us something like we wouldn't expect. You could give us something new in the world, and that is what uh, Leo does. This piece, this piece that also uses the, the workings of glass, the bringing together the community that glass working engenders, is about, is about the encounters, the community that we can make, and that glass working does make, and what happens when you make that uh, community intentionally. So, this work is uh, our Louisville's own, Shea Rhodes, right over there, is involved in, in, this, in this work. Yes, there will be an opportunity for applause, but I like that. I commend that uh, because Shea deserves it. Um, this, is a, this is a work by Collaborative named uh, Related Tactics. And this work, I'm showing you, everything that I'm showing you is part of the work. But it grew out of um, this this infographic, this artwork um, that, this, that the collective developed for a publication I used to edit called New Glass Review in, in the summer of 2020. And I oh, am so privileged. I am so privileged, and I was so privileged in my position at Corning to be able to have conversations, you know, to have conversations with folks. And I had called up Nate Watson, who is part of this collective of three people, in the summer of 2020 because I learned about a grant. I learned about a grant that um, was for craft organizations, and they weren't getting enough glass applications. And Nate, at the time, was the executive director of, the, of a glass studio in San Francisco. And I was like, maybe you should apply for this. Maybe you can get this. And we were talking, and Nate is one of, uh, few but hopefully growing um, black glass artists and in that summer his image was everywhere it was on every single glass institutions Instagram it was on every single thing look we got one and it was awful it was awful and it was ridiculous and it was unnecessary and all those people did all of that without talking to him and we were talking and it was we we were actually going to press on new glass review and I was like man this is not nice you know that I have like but and and it's all laid out but it's not nice to give you a short deadline but if you want to do something you know he was like I want to do something you know we want to do something so they wrote this incredible uh, in incredible instructions and gift, it is the most generous thing I, I, it's one of the most generous things I've ever experienced about how not to be a jerk, basically. <laughs> how not to be a jerk as an, as an institution run mostly by white people. Um, you know, how not to be a jerk to society is a freaking gift. <laughs> and, um, and as part of it, they did uh, data analysis of the, of the whiteness of glass, which as it turns out, as you can see here, it's very white, very white. And what followed was a list of recommendations and, um, and, and ways to be in the world. And then from that, they, um, they applied for a grant from the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design. And I was very privileged to get to be um, like an editor. <laughs> you know, I am privileged to have a hand a little bit in, in a conversation of what they were doing. And what they realized was there are so many there, there are actually a number of artists of color working in glass, but the experience is atomized. The experience is to be one of the only ones, you know, to be in the studios, one of the only ones. And, and the question was, and what you're reading here, you don't really need to read the whole thing, but you can. The, 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 the idea that they came up with, related tactics, doesn't mostly work in glass. They're mostly social practice. They create opportunities and environments. And what they were, th they were working on here, and it could be any community of artists, it doesn't have to be glass, is how can you make a real community, 
How can you really build the real community when people are spread across, uh, across the country? How can you make a kind of situation where there can be the mentorship, where you can fall and be caught, the kinds of things that we all need to grow and be the best versions of ourselves that we could be? And they came up with this idea to do something like a game of telephone which is what you've been reading on the side. They came up with these data visualizations, these uh, data, data visualization drawings, they call them, which they gave to each of six artists, Shay being one of them. I know this has your name spelled wrong. This is from their Instagram. I didn't go in and edit or ask them to. Mm. Um, and then, a, and those six artists would write instructions, and those instructions would be given to six more artists who would meet together in a convening in uh, in Philadelphia, Tyler University, for three for three days to make work. And and then the result would be. Uh, the result of this project would be hopefully uh, some strong community, which I think happened. And. And what would be shown would be the kind of process. So here you see these data visualization drawings that they gave. They are, um, they are, I think, pretty incredible. And they talk about a lot of things that are important, like um, the top left, the accumulation of, of people of color's undervalued and under-recognized labor, um, to ones like the middle on the bottom, which I really like navigating the institution while being simultaneously invisible and hyper-visible, and it's a crumpled piece of paper. They gave these things out, and, they, and they, the instructions were generated, and then they had this convening. And their idea was that each one of these six artists that came to the convening was going to make just one work based on the instructions that they'd received, and kind of like by themselves. But what happened, totally, to totally organically, was that everybody started working together, and that it, it kind of became literally, uh, literally the trust fall situation that they were thinking about. Artists like Vanessa German, who, um, who you should write her name down, you should write her name down, Vanessa German, and you should YouTube her, and you should watch any single talk that she has given because she is unbelievable. And any time you spend in the presence, digitally or physically, of Vanessa German is time that you will spend becoming a better human being. So I'm serious, get your phones out, write it down. You know, Vanessa German. She has made works in glass, but she is not a glass worker. Um, and she got there, and she saw that everybody else pretty much was, and she felt so uncomfortable. She felt so uncomfortable that she thought about leaving. She really thought about leaving. And then another one of the artists, Pearl Dick from Chicago, was like, oh, no, you, you've got this. You can stay. You can be here. And Vanessa, who was almost in tears, stayed, but she didn't just stay. She realized that she could contribute what she does. You know, she is a performance artist. She is, uh, she does, um, she does spoken word, she makes sculpture, and she sang the pieces into being. She stood near the people working, and she, she sang, and, and it was universally, I think, by everybody there, one of the most powerful experiences anybody had had in a hot shop, and all of these people coming together, and it really worked to be able to create that trust fall. There's another artist who really only worked in flame working, not big hot shop stuff, little things, and flame workers mostly work by themselves, and she also felt a little bit of imposter syndrome, and also felt like, man, I've never gotten to work with a bunch of people, let alone a bunch of other artists of color, and she she, she, like it broke her practice open and she is now thinking about what she does in a very different way. And that, I think, is one of the most powerful things. Here you can see a little bit about what these like kind of threads are like. So here you see the image on the left that was given to Shay, and you see a little bit of what Shay uh, wrote. I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. I should have told you. I hope it's okay. It's okay. I can skip by if you don't want anybody to see it. Okay. And, and on the right, Shay's, what Shay wrote was given to Vanessa German, and here is one image, one part of what she made, but she made so much. And, um, well, should I, do you guys want me to read some of this out, or you're good? You want me to hear it? Who wants me to read some out? Raise your hand. All right, I'll read some out. Okay. So, so well, you never know when a slide is up, you know, a person reading it or not. Um, yeah, I know. I know, I'm sorry, this is very, at least I'm not making you get up here, Shay. Okay, uh, step one, establish a perspective from which to begin the project. 
Consider the underrepresentation of black Americans in the fields of fine art and fine craft, and how that contrasts with the seldom acknowledged fact that many enslaved colonial American blacks were skilled workers and craftspeople. Through the though the prevailing narrative would have us believe that the benefit of a free labor force was somehow restricted only to the toilsome, mindless drudgery of picking cotton, the fact is that utilizing expertise they immigrated with or acquired in captivity, enslaved American blacks commonly excelled as highly skilled and inventive workers in the disciplines of pottery, textiles, blacksmithing, boat building, printmaking, masonry, carpentry, and beyond. The contributions these people made have not been appropriately recognized, and the extent of their achievement is not reflected in the numbers of minorities currently occupying established roles in the fields of art, craft, and education. Focusing on glass, also consider the fact that glass was commonly exchanged for human currency as a part of the colonial slave trade. Additionally, it is interesting to consider the fact that African blacks and colonial blacks were so enchanted with glass that among them it was at times used as currency. Reflect on how we, as modern craftspeople, can use our skills and knowledge as currency to enhance and fortify the community. It's powerful. It's magical. It's magical not just in the context of this, um, this chain of events that made these works, but it is powerful in that this work was then displayed. Ooh at the Center for Craft in Asheville, and that this fall it will, open in, uh, um, it, it will open at the Corning Museum of Glass and be codified in a catalog. Um, it's powerful. It's powerful to make that work. It's powerful that that work exists, and it's powerful that that work will go on. And, and it is powerful that now there are networks that can go on and continue to build and grow. And so that graphic that I showed at the beginning of this vignette perhaps will one day not be so freaking overwhelmingly white. Go for it. Do it. <sighs> so the question was, they really exchanged humans for glass? And the answer is yes. The answer, the answer is complicated and nuanced, and I am vaguely, but not, not enough um, educated on, though I can point you. But beads, glass beads, are, are the, the history of glass beads. Slight digression, y'all. But the history of glass beads is actually one of the most fascinating, one of the most wholly understudied, and one of the, uh, the least represented in any glass collection. And, it, and the story of glass beads is so important because, because it's not a dir direct one-to-one, one -one, but the role of beads in, the, in Africa before the slave trade, during the slave trade, and after the slave trade is, uh, is complicated. And it's nuanced, but it was absolutely the fact that glass beads were exchanged for human, human lives. <sighs> Let's just do that together, y'all. Like, seriously. I will also say, we can talk about this, we can all talk about this uh, when I'm done, but you should know Shay if you don't already, uh, because you are here in Louisville and it would be a good connection. It's hard to go to what I'm going next from where we just were. So I'm pausing so that we can have a moment to do that. But where we're going next is also about what it is to have under-recognized, to be able to take something that hasn't been paid attention to as much as it should, and to bring it into a, a different level of awareness. But it is nothing. You know, when I've given this talk before, I haven't, I haven't had, I, 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 I've had other things in there, and I haven't had um, your words, Shay. Uh, this was, you know, special for the home, hometown crew, and I think it made it much better. But I find myself in this moment in a different place than I am, um, and a, a place I'm happy to be in, but a different place. And I didn't give, to be honest, I didn't give as much consideration to what I was doing when I put that slide in there and to where we're going. So thank you for bringing me to this moment very much.
And I will say, if you want to learn more about this project, you can look at Related Tactics website. You can look at the Center for Craft, and you can go to Corning in the fall. I won't be at the museum, but you can get in touch with me, and I'll give you a tour. Okay. If the last vignette was about how we can come together, how we can be uh, better versions of ourselves, how we can create space or <laughs> create space for other people to create space, you know, <laughs> that's the best part of that project. I feel so privileged to be like tangential, but I was not involved, you know, I'm not there, like it is not uh, my, it's not my thing, but it is like the thing that I think is the coolest thing that happened and I was so happy to be just on the periphery. This vignette is about smashing expectations and it is about seeing where many of the people are at and seeing what, uh, what seeing, it's, it's a different way for me at least, to um, check my prejudices and to expand my notions of things. Although I will tell you that this is an underrepresented glass community but it is also an incredibly white one and an incredibly male one. Um, so there you go. Uh, and this is the field of uh, glass cannabis pipe making. Yes, yes, which this is also a commission. This is the first glass cannabis pipe that ever entered a, an art museum's collection as a commission in 2019. And maybe this is also a good place to say that for every commission, we made, um, we made a, a video, kind of thematic video that gets into things. And they're all really great. And they're on the Corning Museum's website. So you can learn more about all of these things um, from there. Oh, gosh, I'm over time. <sighs> I'll speed up. Um, anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, we are almost there. We're at the end, you know. Uh, this is the first pipe ever to enter a, a glass museum collection or an, an art museum's collection. This is the second one. Um, and now the Smithsonian has one, and other museums are, are working on it. And this field, this field which um, started in the late 1990s, uh, it started, it, it really spread across the country as the Grateful Dead stopped touring. I'll mention here that there's a really big crossover between the Grateful Dead, unexpected and interesting crossover between the Grateful Dead and the beginning of graffiti but that's for a different time, um, as the Grateful Dead stopped touring. And a fellow named Bob Snodgrass, who's kind of the Johnny Appleseed of pipe making, settled down in Eugene, Oregon, and started teaching people to make these pipes. And uh, with all this extra time on their hands, because they weren't following the Grateful Dead, all of a sudden, people, w <laughs> it's true. <laughs> They would move into studios and they would start working and they, they were learning without much of a sense of, um, of how to do it. And at the time that they started, there weren't colors even in borosilicate glass, the kind of glass that's used to make these pipes. And the pipe makers over the last 25 years, 30 years, have really pushed the limits of the technique and technology so that now there are hundreds of glass, uh, hundreds, of, um, hundreds of colors and you can do so many different kinds of things. And now there's even... Um, uh, the first industrial designer in in uh, in a pipe making space is a fellow named Micah Evans, um, who was a resident at the Penland School of Crafts for three years, and whose work brings together many different aspects of things. But why do I think this is interesting? Why do I think it's important? Why am I even telling you about it? Well, I'm I'm telling you about it one because um, because I've been dreaming of doing an exhibition on this for. 23 years, and I'm finally getting to do it, um, which I'm really looking forward to. But also because, but also because when I was in college, lo, those many years ago, at the University of Wisconsin Madison, which was soon after, you know, soon after this form started to get its, uh, you know, spread all over the place, here I was studying fine arts and thinking that I was real special, you know, all my avant-garde art, all my, all my different kinds of things like. Give me an L. Lisitsky, like give me the hardest stuff, you know, a green triangle, a black square. I'm totally into it. Real proud of myself. But, you know, yes, all this hard to interpret contemporary art. But then I saw all these people on campus, people that 
felt like, you know, they would say, oh, I have no artistic bone in my body. I don't care about art. I, they never come to a lecture here, you know. But they were ag majors and they were business majors and who knows what else, communications. And here they would have these incredible conversations about the form and decoration and the way that those things contributed to function. And not just, you know, on a like, does it work level, but on a kind of, um, you know, whatever you ascribe uh, artistic sens sensibilities to. And here I thought, wow, that's an incredible thing. Here is an art form that's made by people, made by American craftsmen that didn't exist, you know, in the course of my life. You know, to that point, I'd seen only two objects, only two objects that didn't exist and suddenly were everywhere. One was the Starbucks to-go cup. <laughs> and the other were these handmade, handmade glass pipes by American people. And I thought to myself, well, that's something. You know, that's something. And, and for all of my life in glass, you know, I've been on all sorts of sides of this. I've had a lot of time to be thinking about it. So if you feel uncomfortable in the audience, that's okay. You know, that's okay. We'll give you some time to catch up. But I thought, there is no other thing that I can think of in my life, in anybody's lives that I know in the United States where a handmade object, handmade in the United States wins. Wow. We should pay attention to that. And then now I dip back into it and I see that so many more people are involved and invested in this particular field than are in any other art field that I see. Like for instance, this artist, Luke Sheaf, who goes by the name Salt, Salt Glass on Instagram, has more than 250,000 followers. Clearly, this is an art form that has something that is speaking to people. And for me, one of the things that's most important in my curatorial practice, but maybe just in me, my orientation in the world, is to see where the people are, you know? Where are the people? And to try and make the work that I do amplify the work that the people are doing or where they are. And so that's why I show this to you today uh, in Smash. So now I'm over, ooh, I'm over, I'm over and you're tired, you know? You've made it, you've made it all of the way. But just to recap, just to recap, to bring us back, reflect, it's about who we are and where we are, the places that we come from and how we can see in a new way. Refract, it's about how we can take the histories that we're given or that we seek out and we can present them in new ways that make sense to us now. Um, encounter is about the ways that glass as a material that um, the, the glass working process can, or any process, we all have the power, can bring together community to make communities that should exist and maybe don't exist but can create opportunities to do it. We can all do that. And smash, which is about the ways that we can break our expectations. We can start to see in new ways. We can, we can stretch ourselves uh, to new understandings. And so with that, thank you. I really feel bad for going over you guys. I used to teach. I know, I know. I used to teach in college, and my students really taught me never to go over, so I'm really sorry. Thank you, Susie. Um, we have time for a few questions. I will bring the microphone to those who do have questions. Anyone? Those are chemists. Those are the chemistry <laughs> chemistry department. I'm pals with those guys from way back. <laughs> but thank you. That was the question. Or the comment was how to get over my fear of physicists. I don't have a fear of physicists. It's just the critique of my uh, bad physics drawings. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I mean, one of the things that intrigues me, and I out of ignorance. Um, are there artists who are engaged with the issues around sustainability in the production of glass? There sure are. Uh, um, there sure are artists that are engaged around sustainability. There are so many, actually. Um, but somebody that comes to mind, well, there's so many, and I have so many thoughts about them, more than we have time for, because I think a lot of the 
glass about sustainability as a great opportunity for some greenwashing because glass is um, um, resource intensive. But there's a couple of projects that I will mention. One, um, the Gwenya glass in the Kingdom of Eswatini, which is a small country inside, uh, um, kind of inside of South Africa, is one of the greenest studios I have ever encountered in my days and has been for some time. So they use all recycled glass. They do rainwater catchment for their for their water and it is solar run and there's many people that are you know the rest of the world is kind of catching up to them but they've been leaders for a long time in that um, there are also uh, designers like Atelier and L from uh, the Netherlands that are thinking about really low locavore glass, um, which is kind of something if you guys are ceramics people, a lot of times ceramicists make their own glass from their from places and you can tell the regional differences, but that hasn't been a practice in glass working since before the Romans, um, more or less. Uh, and they, um, they've brought that back and they make different glass chemistries using the sand from particular beaches. So um, that's one. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Keep going. All right, well thank you everyone. Um, I'm gonna put Shay on the spot again. There's a, oh, sorry. I just wanted to let everyone know you mentioned Vanessa German. And we're yeah, really I was just going to mention that. She's uh, right across the bridge here in our, in the garden installation. So if you have some time, I encourage you to walk over and check out those galleries. Did you and hear you, that? I haven't been there yet. Vanessa German in the next yeah, gallery. Yeah, into the old building. And we have a work by Shay just out here in the atrium as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.